Hello, Nightcappers, and welcome to Gothic Nightcap, a Soul Latte Studios podcast where you listen to classic tales that can be equal parts soothing and darkness. I grew up in a house that was built in the 80s, the 1880s. It was this amazing big old house where the keyholes were skeleton keys. Don't tell my sisters, but those can be picked with a wire coat hanger. The windows were leaded glass, and the top floor had all these wonderfully strange closets. Well, sort of. The rooms on either end of the top floor had two interior doors. One led to a finished walk-in closet with a sloped ceiling due to it being against the roof outside. The second interior door led to an unfinished room that served as storage space. I don't remember what we stored there, because I did my best to ignore that door's existence. That attic space creeped me out. Well, that's not quite true. It scared the crap out of me. It didn't have that much stored in it. I could see most every corner. I could even reach the string to turn on the light without having to let go of the door jam, which was the only way I'd ever turn on the light. It was mostly just a feeling I had when I looked at the door, or opened the door, or looked through the boxes that were stored in there. Something I only did if one of my sisters was with me. Looking back now, I still have no shame about that fear. Mostly because I'm not convinced I was entirely wrong about that creepy room. And nightcappers don't even get me started on the room under the basement stairs. Duh. Well, in the unlikely event that you have no idea what I mean, that you have never experienced the hairs on the back of your neck standing on end when you enter a certain room, that you've never noticed that a place just felt wrong. Then sit back and relax with the rest of us who know that feeling all too well and listen to my reading of The Hall Bedroom by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman. We begin. My name is Mrs. Elizabeth Jennings. I am a highly respectable woman. I may style myself a gentlewoman, for in my youth I enjoyed advantages. I was well brought up, and I graduated at a young lady's seminary. I also married well. My husband was that most genteel of all merchants, an apothecary. His shop was on the corner of the main street in Rockton, the town where I was born and where I lived until the death of my husband. My parents had died when I had been married a short time, so I was left quite alone in the world. I was not competent to carry on the apothecary business by myself, for I had no knowledge of drugs, and I had a mortal terror of giving poisons instead of medicines. Therefore, I was obliged to sell at a considerable sacrifice, and the proceeds, some $5,000, were all I had in the world. The income was not enough to support me in any kind of comfort, and I saw that I must, in some way, earn money. I thought at first of teaching, but I was no longer young, and methods had changed since my school days. What I was able to teach, nobody wished to know. I could think of only one thing to do. Take boarders. But the same objection to that business as to the teaching held good in Rockton. Nobody wished to board. My husband had rented a house with a number of bedrooms, and I advertised, but nobody applied. Finally, my cash was running very low, and I became desperate. I packed up my furniture, rented a large house in this town, and moved here. It was a venture, attended with many risks. In the first place, the rent was exorbitant. In the next, I was entirely unknown. However, I am a person of considerable ingenuity and have inventive power and much enterprise when the occasion presses. I advertised in a very original manner, although that actually took my last penny, that is, the last penny of my ready money, and I was forced to draw on my principal to purchase my first supplies, a thing which I had resolved never on any account to do. But the great risk met with a reward, for I had several applicants within two days after my advertisement appeared in the paper. 
Within two weeks, my boarding house was well established. I became very successful, and my success would have been uninterrupted had it not been for the mysterious and bewildering occurrences which I am about to relate. I am now forced to leave the house and rent another. Some of my old boarders accompany me. Some, with the most unreasonable nervousness, refuse to be longer associated in any way, however indirectly, with the terrible and uncanny happenings which I have to relate. It remains to be seen whether my ill luck in this house will follow me into another, and whether my whole prosperity in life will be forever shadowed by the mystery of the hall bedroom. Instead of telling the strange story myself in my own words, I shall present the journal of Mr. George H. Wheatcroft. I shall show you the portions beginning on January 18th of the present year, the date when he took up his residence with me. Here it is. January 18th, 1883. Here I am established in my new boarding house. I have, as befits my humble means, the hall bedroom, even the hall bedroom on the third floor. I have heard all my life of hall bedrooms. I have seen hall bedrooms. I have been in them. But never until now, when I am actually established in one, did I comprehend what at once an ignominious and sternly uncompromising thing a hall bedroom is. It proves the ignominy of the dweller therein. No man at thirty-six, my age, would be domiciled in a hall bedroom unless he were himself ignominious, at least comparatively speaking. I am proved by this means incontrovertibly to have been left far behind in the race. I see no reason why I should not live in this hall bedroom for the rest of my life. That is, if I have money enough to pay the landlady— and that seems probable, since my small funds are invested as safely as if I were an orphan ward in charge of a pillar of a sanctuary. After the valuables have been stolen, I have most carefully locked the stable door. I have experienced the revulsion which comes sooner or later to the adventurous soul, who experiences nothing but defeat and so-called ill luck. I have swung to the opposite extreme. I have lost in everything. I have lost in love, I have lost in money, I have lost in the struggle for preferment, I have lost in health and strength. I am now settled down in a hall bedroom to live upon my small income and regain my health by mild potations of the mineral waters here, if possible. If not, to live here without my health, for mine is not a necessarily fatal malady, until providence shall take me out of my hall bedroom. There is no one place more than another where I care to live. There is not sufficient motive to take me away, even if the mineral waters did not benefit me. So I am here, and to stay in the hall bedroom. The landlady is civil, and even kind, as kind as a woman who has to keep her poor womanly eye upon the main chance can be. The struggle for money always injures the fine grain of a woman. She is too fine a thing to do it. She does not by nature belong with the gold grubbers, and it therefore lowers her. She steps from heights to claw and scrape and dig, but she cannot help it oftentimes, poor thing, and her deterioration thereby is to be condoned. The landlady is all she can be, taking her strain of adverse circumstances into consideration, and the table is good, even conscientiously so. It looks to me as if she were foolish enough to strive to give the boarders their money's worth, with the due regard for the main chance which is inevitable. However, that is of minor importance to me, since my diet is restricted. It is curious what an annoyance a restriction in diet can be to a man who has considered himself somewhat indifferent to gastronomic delights. There was today a pudding for dinner, which I could not taste without penalty, but which I longed for. It was only because it looked unlike any other pudding that I had ever seen and assumed a mental and spiritual significance. It seemed to me, whimsically no doubt, as if tasting it might give me a new sensation and consequently a new outlook. Trivial things may lead to large results. Why should I not get a new outlook by means of a pudding? Life here stretches before me most monotonously, and I feel like clutching at alleviations, though paradoxically, since I have settled down with the utmost acquiescence. 
Still, one cannot immediately overcome and change radically all one's nature. Now I look at myself critically and search for the keynote to my whole self and my actions. I have always been conscious of a reaching out, an overweening desire for the new, the untried, for the broadness of further horizons, the seas beyond the seas, the thought beyond thought. This characteristic has been the primary cause of all my misfortunes. I have the soul of an explorer, and in nine out of ten cases, this leads to destruction. If I had possessed capital and sufficient push, I should have been one of the searchers after the North Pole. I have been an eager student of astronomy, I have studied botany with avidity, and had dreamed of new flora in unexplored parts of the world, and the same with animal life and geology. I longed for riches in order to discover the power and sense of possession of the rich. I longed for love in order to discover the possibilities of the emotions. I longed for all that the mind of man could conceive as desirable for man, not so much for purely selfish ends as from an insatiable thirst for knowledge of a universal trend. But I have limitations. I do not quite understand of what nature— for what mortal ever did quite understand his own limitations, since a knowledge of them would preclude their existence. But they have prevented my progress to any extent. Therefore, behold me in my hall bedroom, settled at last into a groove of fate so deep that I have lost the sight of even my horizons. Just at present, as I write, my horizon on the left, that is, my physical horizon, is a wall covered with cheap paper. The paper is an indeterminate pattern in white and gilt. There are a few photographs of my own hung about, and on the large wall space beside the bed there is a large oil painting, which belongs to my landlady. It has a massive tarnished gold frame, and, curiously enough, the painting itself is rather good. I have no idea who the artist could have been. It is of the conventional landscape type in vogue some fifty years since, the type so fondly reproduced in chromos, the winding river with the little boat occupied by a pair of lovers, the cottage nestled among the trees on the right shore, the gentle slope of the hills and the church spire in the background. But still, it is well done. It gives me the impression of an artist without the slightest originality of design, but much of technique. But for some inexplicable reason, the picture frets me. I find myself gazing at it when I do not wish to do so. It seems to compel my attention like some intent face in the room. I shall ask Mrs. Jennings to have it removed. I will hang in its place some photographs which I have in a trunk. January 26. I do not write regularly in my journal. I never did. I see no reason why I should. I see no reason why anyone should have the slightest sense of duty in such a matter. Some days I have nothing which interests me sufficiently to write out. Some days I feel either too ill or too indolent. For four days I have not written from a mixture of all three reasons. Now, today, I both feel like it and I have something to write. Also, I am distinctly better than I have been. Perhaps the waters are benefiting me, or the change of air, or possibly it is something else more subtle. Possibly my mind has seized upon something new, a discovery which causes it to react upon my failing body and serves as a stimulant. All I know is, I feel distinctly better and am conscious of an acute interest in doing so, which is of late strange to me. I have been rather indifferent, and sometimes have wondered if that were not the cause rather than the result of my state of health. I have been so continually balked that I have settled into a state of inertia. I lean rather comfortably against my obstacles. After all, the worst of the pain always lies in the struggle. Give up, and it is rather pleasant than otherwise. If one did not kick, the pricks would not in the least matter. However, for some reason, for the last few days, I seem to have awakened from my state of quiescence. It means future trouble for me, no doubt, but in the meantime, I am not sorry. It began with the picture, the large oil painting. I went to Mrs. Jennings about it yesterday, and she, to my surprise, for I thought it a matter that could be easily arranged, objected to having it removed. 
Her reasons were two, both simple, both sufficient, especially since I, after all, had no very strong desire either way. It seems that the picture does not belong to her. It hung here when she rented the house. She says if it is removed, a very large and unsightly discoloration of the wallpaper will be exposed, and she does not like to ask for new paper. The owner, an old man, is traveling abroad, the agent is curt, and she has only been in the house a very short time. Then it would mean a sad upheaval of my room, which would disturb me. She also says there is no place in the house where she can store the picture, and there is not a vacant space in another room for one so large. So, I let the picture remain. It really, when I came to think of it, was very immaterial after all. But I got my photographs out of my trunk, and I hung them around the large picture. The wall is almost completely covered. I hung them yesterday afternoon, and last night I repeated a strange experience which I have had, in some degree, every night since I have been here, but was not sure whether it deserved the name of experience, but was not rather one of those dreams in which one dreams one is awake. But last night it came again, and now I know there is something very singular about this room. I am very much interested. I will write down for future reference the events of last night, Concerning those of the preceding nights since I have slept in this room, I will simply say that they have been of a similar nature, but, as it were, only the preliminary stages, the prologue to what happened last night. I am not depending upon the mineral waters here as the one remedy for my malady, which is sometimes of an acute nature, and indeed constantly threatens me with considerable suffering unless by medicine I can keep it in check. I will say that the medicine which I employ is not of the class commonly known as drugs. It is impossible that it can be held responsible for what I am about to transcribe. My mind last night, and every night since I have slept in this room, was in an absolutely normal state. I take this medicine, prescribed by the specialist, in whose charge I was before coming here, regularly every four hours while awake. As I am never a good sleeper, it follows that I am enabled with no inconvenience to take any medicine during the night with the same regularity as during the day. It is my habit, therefore, to place my bottle and spoon where I can put my hand upon them easily without lighting the gas. Since I have been in this room, I have placed the bottle of medicine upon my dresser at the side of the room opposite the bed. I have done this rather than place it nearer, as once I jostled the bottle and spilled most of the contents, and it is not easy for me to replace it, as it is expensive. Therefore, I placed it in security on the dresser, and indeed it is but three or four steps from my bed, the room being so small. Last night I awakened as usual, and I knew, since I had fallen asleep about eleven, that it must be in the neighborhood of three. I wake with almost clock-like regularity, and it is never necessary for me to consult my watch. I had slept unusually well and without dreams, and awoke fully at once with a feeling of refreshment to which I am not accustomed. I immediately got out of bed and began stepping across the room in the direction of my dresser, on which I had set my medicine bottle and spoon. To my utter amazement, the steps which had hitherto sufficed to take me across my room did not suffice to do so. I advanced several paces, and my outstretched hands touched nothing. I stopped and went on again. I was sure that I was moving in a straight direction, and even if I had not been, I knew it was impossible to advance in any direction in my tiny apartment without coming into collision either with a wall or a piece of furniture. I continued to walk falteringly, as I have seen people on the stage. A step, then a long falter, then a sliding step. I kept my hands extended. They touched nothing. I stopped again. I had not the least sentiment of fear or consternation. I was rather the very stupefaction of surprise. How is this? seemed thundering in my ears. What is this? The room was perfectly dark. There was nowhere any glimmer, as is usually the case, even in a so-called dark room, from the walls, picture frames, looking glass, or white objects. It was absolute gloom. The house stood in a quiet part of town. There were many trees about. The electric street lights were extinguished at midnight. There was no moon and the sky was cloudy. I could not distinguish my one window, which I thought strange even on such a dark night. Finally, I changed my plan of motion and turned, as nearly as I could estimate, at right angles. 
Now I thought I must reach soon if I kept on my writing table underneath the window, or, if I'm going in the opposite direction, the hall door. I reached neither. I am telling the unvarnished truth when I say that I began to count my steps and carefully measure my paces after that, and I traversed a space clear of furniture at least twenty feet by thirty, a very large apartment, and as I walked I was conscious that my naked feet were pressing something which gave rise to sensations the like of which I had never experienced before. As nearly as I can express it, it was as if my feet pressed something as elastic as air or water, which was in this case unyielding to my weight. It gave me a curious sensation of buoyancy and stimulation. At the same time, this surface, if surface might be the right name, which I trod, felt cool to my feet with the coolness of vapor or fluidity, seeming to overlap the soles. Finally, I stood still. My surprise was at last merging into a measure of consternation. Where am I? I thought. What am I going to do? Stories that I had heard of travelers being taken from their beds and conveyed into strange and dangerous places, middle-aged stories of the Inquisition flashed through my brain. I knew all the time that for a man who had gone to bed in the commonplace hall bedroom in a very commonplace little town, such surmises were highly ridiculous. But it is hard for the human mind to grasp anything but a human explanation of phenomena. Almost anything seemed then, and seems now, more rational than an explanation bordering upon the supernatural, as we understand the supernatural. At last I called, though rather softly, "'What does this mean?' I said quite aloud. "'Where am I? Who is here? Who is doing this? I tell you, I will have no such nonsense.' Speak if there is anybody here. But all was dead silence. Then suddenly a light flashed through the open transom of my door. Somebody had heard me, a man who rooms next door, a decent kind of man, also here for his health. He turned on the gas in the hall and called to me. What's the matter? He asked in an agitated, trembling voice. He is a nervous fellow. Directly when the light flashed through my transom, I saw that I was in my familiar hall bedroom. I could see everything quite distinctly. My tumbled bed, my writing table, my dresser, my chair, my little washstand, my clothes hanging on a row of pegs, the old picture on the wall. The picture gleamed out with singular distinctness in the light from the transom. The river seemed actually to run and ripple, and the boat to be gliding with the current. I gazed fascinated at it as I replied to the anxious voice. "'Nothing is the matter with me,' said I. "'Why?' "'I thought I heard you speak,' said the man outside. "'I thought maybe you were sick.' "'No,' I called back. "'I am all right. I am trying to find my medicine in the dark, that's all. I can see now you have lighted the gas.' "'Nothing is the matter?' "'No. Sorry I disturbed you. Good night.' "'Good night.' Then I heard the man's door shut after a minute's pause. He was evidently not quite satisfied. I took a pull at my medicine bottle and got into bed. He had left the hall gas burning. I did not go to sleep again for some time. Just before I did so, someone, probably Mrs. Jennings, came out in the hall and extinguished the gas. This morning when I awoke, everything was as usual in my room. I wonder if I shall have any such experience tonight. January 27. I shall write in my journal every day until this draws to some definite issue. Last night my strange experience deepened, as something tells me it will continue to do. I retired quite early at half past ten. I took the precaution on retiring to place beside my bed, on a chair, a box of safety matches that I might not be in the dilemma of the night before. I took my medicine on retiring that made me do to wake up at half past two. I had not fallen asleep directly, but had certainly had three hours of sound, dreamless slumber when I awoke. I lay a few minutes hesitating whether or not to strike a safety match and light my way to the dresser, whereupon stood my medicine bottle. I hesitated, not because I had the least sensation of fear, but because of the same shrinking from a nerve shock that leads one at times to dread the plunge into an icy bath. 
it seemed much easier to me to strike that match and cross my hall bedroom to my dresser, take my dose, then return quietly to my bed, than to risk the chance of floundering about in some unknown limbo, either of fancy or reality. At last, however, the spirit of adventure, which has always been such a ruling one for me, conquered. I rose, I took the box of safety matches in my hand, and started on, as I conceived, the straight course for my dresser, about five feet across from my bed. As before, I traveled and traveled, and did not reach it. I advanced with groping hands extended, setting one foot cautiously before the other, but I touched nothing except the indefinite, unnameable surface which my feet pressed. All of a sudden, though, I became aware of something. One of my senses was saluted, nay, more than that, hailed with imperiousness, and that was, strangely enough, my sense of smell, but in a hitherto unknown fashion. It seemed as if the odor reached my mentality first. I reversed the usual process, which is, as I understand it, like this. The odor, when encountered, strikes first the olfactory nerve, which transmits the intelligence to the brain. It is as if, to put it rudely, my nose met a rose, and then the nerve belonging to the sense said to my brain, here is a rose. This time my brain said, here is a rose, and my sense then recognized it. I say rose, but it was not a rose, that is, not the fragrance of any rose which I had ever known. It was undoubtedly a flower odor, and rose came perhaps the nearest to it. My mind realized it first with what seemed a leap of rapture. What is this delight? I asked myself. And then the ravishing fragrance smote my sense. I breathed it in and it seemed to feed my thoughts, satisfying some hitherto unknown hunger. Then I took a step further, and another fragrance appeared, which I likened to lilies for lack of something better. And then came violets, then mignonette. I cannot describe the experience, but it was a sheer delight, a rapture of sublimated sense. I groped further and further and always into new waves of fragrance. I seemed to be wading breast high through flower beds of paradise, but all the time I touched nothing with my groping hands. At last a sudden giddiness as of surfeit overcame me. I realized that I might be in some unknown peril. I was distinctly afraid. I struck one of my safety matches, and I was in my hall bedroom, midway between my bed and my dresser. I took my dose of medicine and went to bed, and after a while fell asleep and did not wake till morning. July 28. Last night I did not take my usual dose of medicine. In these days of new remedies and mysterious results upon certain organizations, it occurred to me to wonder if possibly the drug might have, after all, something to do with my strange experience. I did not take my medicine. I put the bottle as usual on my dresser, since I feared if I interrupted further the customary sequence of affairs, I might fail to wake. I placed my box of matches on the chair beside the bed. I fell asleep about quarter past eleven o'clock and I waked when the clock was striking two, a little earlier than my wont. I did not hesitate this time. I rose at once, took my box of matches, and proceeded as formerly. I walked what seemed a great space without coming into collision with anything. I kept sniffing for the wonderful fragrances of the night before, but they did not recur. Instead, I was suddenly aware that I was tasting something some morsel of sweetness hitherto unknown, and, as in the case of the odor, the usual order seemed reversed, and it was as if I tasted it first in my mental consciousness. Then the sweetness rolled under my tongue. I thought involuntarily of sweeter than honey or the honeycomb of the scripture. I thought of the Old Testament manna, an ineffable content as of satisfied hunger seized me. I stepped further and a new savor was upon my palate, and so on. It was never cloying, though of such sharp sweetness that it fairly stung. It was the merging of a material sense into a spiritual one. I said to myself, I have lived my life and always have I gone hungry until now. I could feel my brain act swiftly under the influence of this heavenly food as under a stimulant. Then suddenly I repeated the experience of the night before. 
I grew dizzy, and an indefinite fear of shrinking were upon me. I struck my safety match and was back in my hall bedroom. I returned to bed and soon fell asleep. I did not take my medicine. I am resolved not to do so longer. I am feeling much better. January 29th. Last night to bed, as usual, matches in place, fell asleep about eleven and waked at half past one. I heard the half hour strike. I am waking earlier and earlier every night. I had not taken my medicine, though it was on the dresser as usual. I again took my matchbox in hand and started to cross the room, and as always, traversed strange spaces. But this night, as seems fated to be the case every night, my experience was different. Last night I neither smelled nor tasted, but I heard. My lord, I heard. The first sound of which I was conscious was one like the constantly gathering and, re and receding murmur of a river, and it seemed to come from the wall behind my bed where the old picture hangs. Nothing in nature except a river gives that impression of at once advance and retreat. I could not mistake it. On, ever on, came the swelling murmur of the waves. Past and ever past they died in the distance. Then I heard above the murmur of the river a song in an unknown tongue which I recognized as being unknown, yet which I understood. But the understanding was in my brain with no words of interpretation. The song had to do with me, but with me in unknown futures for which I had no images of comparison in the past. Yet a sort of ecstasy as of a prophecy of bliss filled my whole consciousness. The song never ceased, but as I moved on, I came into new sound waves. There was the pealing of bells which might have been made of crystal, and might have summoned to the gates of heaven. There was music of strange instruments, great harmonies pierced now and then by small whispers as of love, and it all filled me with a certainty of a future of bliss. At last I seemed the center of a mighty orchestra which constantly deepened and increased until I seemed to feel myself being lifted gently but mightily upon the waves of sound as upon the waves of a sea. Then again the terror and the impulse to flee to my own familiar scenes was upon me. I struck my match and was back in my hall bedroom. I do not see how I sleep at all after such wonders. But sleep I do. I slept dreamlessly until daylight this morning. January 30 I heard yesterday something with regard to my hall bedroom which affected me strangely. I cannot for the life of me say whether it intimidated me, filled me with the horror of the abnormal, or rather roused to a greater degree my spirit of adventure and discovery. I was down at the cure and was sitting on the veranda sipping idly my mineral water, when... Somebody spoke my name. Mr. Wheatcroft, said the voice politely, interrogatively, somewhat apologetically, as if to provide for a possible mistake in my identity. I turned and saw a gentleman whom I recognized at once. I seldom forget names or faces. He was a Mr. Addison whom I had seen considerable of three years ago at a little summer hotel in the mountains. It was one of those passing acquaintances which signify little one way or the other. If never renewed, you have no regret. If renewed, you accept the renewal with no hesitation. It is in every way negative. But just now, in my feeble, friendless state, the sight of a face which beams with pleased remembrance is rather grateful. I felt distinctly glad to see the man. He sat down beside me. He also had a glass of water. His health, while not as bad as mine, leaves much to be desired. Addison had often been in this town before. He had, in fact, lived here at one time. He had remained at the cure three years, taking the waters daily. He therefore knows about all there is to be known about the town, which is not very large. He asked me where I was staying, and when I told him the street, rather excitedly inquired the number. When I told him the number, which is 240, he gave a manifest start, and after one sharp glance at me, sipped his water in silence for a moment. He had so evidently betrayed some ulterior knowledge with regard to my residence that I questioned him. "'What do you know about 240 Pleasant Street?' said I. "'Oh, nothing,' he replied, evasively, sipping his water. After a little while, however, 
he inquired, in what he evidently tried to render as a casual tone, what room I occupied. I once lived a few weeks at 240 Pleasant Street myself, he said. That house always was a boarding house, I guess. It had stood vacant for a term of years before the present occupant rented it, I believe, I remarked. Then I answered his question. I have the hall bedroom on the third floor, said I. The quarters are pretty straightened, but comfortable enough as hall bedrooms go. But Mr. Addison had showed such unmistakable consternation at my reply that then I persisted in my questioning as to the cause, and at last he yielded and told me what he knew. He had hesitated both because he shrank from displaying what I might consider an unmanly superstition, and because he did not wish to influence me beyond what the facts of the case warranted. "'Well, I will tell you, Wheatcroft,' he said. "'Briefly, all I know is this. "'When last I heard of 240 Pleasant Street, "'it was not rented because of foul play "'which was supposed to have taken place there, "'though nothing was ever proved. "'There were two disappearances, "'and, in each case, of an occupant of the hall bedroom "'which you now have. "'The first disappearance was of a very beautiful girl "'who had come here for her health and was said to be the victim of a profound melancholy induced by a love disappointment. She obtained board at 2.40 and occupied the hall bedroom about two weeks. Then one morning, she was gone, having seemingly vanished into thin air. Her relatives were communicated with. She had not many, nor friends either, poor girl, and a thorough search was made. But the last I knew, she had never come to light. There were two or three arrests, but nothing ever came of them. Well, that was before my day here, but the second disappearance took place when I was in the house. A fine young fellow who had overworked in college, he had to pay his own way. He had taken cold, had the grip, and that the overwork about finished him, and he came on here for a month's rest and recuperation. He had been in that room about two weeks, a little less, when one morning he wasn't there. There was a great hullabaloo. It seems that he had let fall some hints to the effect that there was something queer about the room, but of course, the police did not think much of that. They made arrests right and left, but they never found him, and the arrested were discharged, though some of them are probably under a cloud of suspicion to this day. Then the boarding house was shut up. Six years ago, nobody would have boarded there, much less occupied that hall bedroom. But now I suppose new people have come in and the story has died out. I dare say your landlady will not thank me for reviving it. I assured him that it would make no possible difference to me. He looked at me sharp and asked bluntly if I had seen anything wrong or unusual about the room. I replied, guarding myself from falsehood with a quibble, that I had seen nothing in the least unusual about the room, as indeed I had not, and have not now, but that may come. I feel that that will come in due time. Last night I neither saw nor heard nor smelled nor tasted, but I felt. Last night, having started again on my exploration of God knows what, I had not advanced a step before I touched something. My first sensation was one of disappointment. It is the dresser, and I am at the end of it now, I thought. But I soon discovered that it was not the old painted dresser which I touched but something carved, as nearly as I could discover with my unskilled fingertips, with winged things. There were certainly long, keen curves of wings, which seemed to overlay an arabesque of fine leaf and flower work. I do not know what the object was that I touched. It may have been a chest. It may have seemed to be exaggerating when I say that it somehow failed or exceeded in some mysterious respect of being the shape of anything I had ever touched. I do not know what the material was. It was as smooth as ivory, but it did not feel like ivory. There was a, a singular warmth about it, as if it had stood long in the hot sunlight. I continued, and I encountered other objects I am inclined to think were pieces of furniture, of fashions, and possibly of uses unknown to me. And about them all was the strange mystery as to shape. At last I came to what was evidently an open window of large area. I distinctly felt a soft, warm wind, yet with a crystal freshness, blow upon my face. It was not the window of my hall bedroom, that I know. Looking out, I could see nothing. I only felt the wind blowing on my face. 
Then, suddenly, without any warning, my groping hands to the right and left touched living beings. Beings in the likeness of men and women, palpable creatures in palpable attire. I could feel the soft silken texture of their garments which swept around me, seeming to half enfold me in clinging meshes like cobwebs. I was in a crowd of these people, wherever they were, and whoever they were. Curiously enough, without seeing one of them, I had a strong sense of recognition as I passed among them. Now and then a hand that I knew closed softly over mine. Once an arm passed around me. Then I began to feel myself gently swept on and impelled by the softly moving throng. Their floating garments seemed to fairly wind me about, and again a swift terror overcame me. I struck my match and was back in my hall bedroom. I wonder if I had not better keep my gas burning tonight. I wonder if it be possible that this is going too far. I wonder what became of those other people, the man and the woman who occupied this room. I wonder if I had not better stop where I am. January 31. Last night I saw, I saw more than I can describe, more than is lawful to describe, something which nature has rightly hidden has been revealed to me. But it is not for me to disclose too much of her secret. This much I will say, that doors and windows open into an out-of-doors to which the outdoors we know is but a vestibule. And there is a river. There is something strange with respect to that picture. There is a river upon which one could sail away. It was flowing silently, for tonight I can only see. I saw that I was right in thinking I recognized some of the people who I encountered the night before, though some were strange to me. It is true that the girl who disappeared from the hall bedroom was very beautiful. Everything which I saw last night was very beautiful to my one sense that could grasp it. I wonder what it would be if all my senses together were to grasp it. I wonder if I had better not keep my gas burning tonight. I wonder... This finishes the journal which Mr. Wheatcroft left in his hall bedroom. The morning after the last entry, he was gone. His friend, Mr. Addison, came here, and a search was made. They even tore down the wall behind the picture, and they did find something rather queer for a house that had been used for borders, where you think no room would have been let run to waste. They found another room, a long, narrow one, the length of the hall bedroom, but narrower, hardly more than a closet. There was no window, no door, and all there was in it was a sheet of paper covered with figures as if somebody has been doing sums. They made a lot of talk about those figures, and they tried to make out that the fifth dimension, whatever that is, was proved, but they said afterward they didn't prove anything. They tried to make out then that somebody had murdered poor Mr. Wheatcroft and hid the body, and they arrested poor Mr. Addison, but they couldn't make out anything against him. They proved he was in the cure all that night and couldn't have done it. They don't know what became of Mr. Wheatcroft, and now they say two more disappeared from that same room before I rented the house. The agent came and promised to put the new room they discovered into the hall bedroom and have everything new papered and painted. He took away the picture. Folks hinted that there was something queer about that. I don't know what. It looked innocent enough, and I guess he burned it up. He said if I would stay, he would arrange it with the owner, who everybody says is a very queer man so I should not have to pay much, if any, rent. But I told him I couldn't stay if he was to give me the rent, that I wasn't afraid of anything myself, though I must say I wouldn't want to put anybody in that hall bedroom without telling him all about it. But my boarders would leave, and I knew I couldn't get any more. I told him I would rather have a regular ghost than what seemed to be a way of going out of the house to nowhere and never coming back again. I moved, and as I said before... It remains to be seen whether my ill luck follows me to this house or not. Anyway, it has no hall bedroom. That was The Hall Bedroom by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman, and thanks for taking the time to listen to my reading of it. Contrary to what my sisters might tell you, I don't just do this because I love to hear myself talk. I, in fact, love to take the journey with you, dear listener. This podcast simply wouldn't be any fun at all without you. So thank you so much for your support 
And by all means, share this with as many people as you think might enjoy it. Gothic Nightcap is available on your favorite podcatcher, and we even have a YouTube channel under Soul Latte Studios. Or you can check out our website at soulattestudios.com. If you've written a story you'd like me to share here, please send me an email or a message on our website. The links are in the description. As long as there are stories in the public domain to read, I'll keep reading them for you, dear nightcappers. I'm Jamie Olson, and I recorded, edited, and produced the podcast. So if anything was wrong, it was my fault. Our cover art is by the incredibly talented Amanda Davini and Kim Rock. And our music is Astaroth by Core Discovery. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Thank you.